This is Mr. Brown, AP Chemistry, and today we're going to be looking at section 9.6, dealing with multiple bonds. In our last set of notes, we were talking about the concept of hybridization, and we were looking at how when atomic orbitals and the electrons in them got involved with covalent bonding, the, the atomic orbitals became molecular orbitals, and you ended up with a new orbital situation. Well, one of the things we didn't really talk about at all is what happens with multiple bonds with hybridization. So that's what we're going to be looking at in section 9.6 is multiple bonding. And really what happened to the whole sigma pi situation we were talking about before. We're also going to look at that in section 9.6. Now, when you take a look at a substance that has multiple bonding like sulfur trioxide, um, let's take a look at a little bit more closely what's going on inside sulfur trioxide. Now the sulfur needs three hybrid orbitals to attach and share with the three oxygens. Remember we have one, two, three electron domains here. So this would be an example of our sp2 hybridization that we talked about yesterday. But what's really happening with that multiple bond? Now when you take a look at what we have available here at the beginning, remember we have S's and P's that get involved in hybridization. And if we need three electron domains, then we would need one of our S's and two of our P's. So we'd be using one of these S's and two of our P's to form three equal energy sp2 hybrid orbitals. And then remember we have that one unhybridized P orbital here left. And when we look at what's happening with multiple bonding, that's going to come into play. So in terms of our three electron domains, we have basically this occurring. We have three equal energy hybrid orbitals, three sp2 orbitals occurring. But what really happened to that unhybridized p orbital? And where is our multiple bonds? What's happening with that? So let's take a closer look at our sp3 hybridization situation. Now, those are our hybrid orbitals. But remember, we still had sulfur's unhybridized p orbital. And oxygen also has an unhybridized p orbital. And what can happen here is that overlap between our two p's that we were talking about a couple of days ago. So what we really get is a situation where we get a side-by-side -side p overlap, and that's where our multiple bond is. Remember, when we're looking at single bonds, those are sigma bonds, the electron is located around the bond plane. And that's happening in each of these locations here. That's where those single bond sigma electrons are located. But in that multiple bond situation, we have overlapping side-by-side -side p's. And remember, in the pi bond, we basically have electrons that exist above and below the bond plane. So our blue situations would all be our sigma bonds. And those would all be our single bonds, which were our sigma bonds there. And the overlapping pi caused by the two side-by-side -side p's is really where our multiple bond is. So that's where the electrons in the multiple bond exist. And that's why we were talking earlier about bond angles. The electrons that are in this multiple bond region are going to exert a greater set of repulsive forces because there's more electrons there than you're getting in each of those hybrid situations. And that's going to squeeze down this bond angle on the far side here. So really, when you have a double bond, remember, we have one sigma. That was our normal hybrid overlap orbital. And then we also have one pi. And when you end up with a triple bond, you end up with two unhybridized p's, one going above and below, one going front and back. And so you end up with two pi bonds in a triple bond situation. So remember, single bonds are always sigma bonds because the sigma overlap is greater, resulting in a stronger bond and lower energy. So we always have a sigma bond, even in multiple bonding situations. In multiple bonding situations, we have the one sigma bond, and then the overlapping p's give us a pi bond. And remember, the electron density is above and below that internuclear bond plane that we've been talking about. Unlike the sigma bond, where the electron density exists between the two nucleuses. So it's in that bond plane in between your internuclear axis. Now in a molecule like formaldehyde, which is shown here at the left, we have three electron domains, so it's going to be an sp2 hybridization situation, which is roughly 120 degrees bond angle in between. Now, each of the single bonds 
in this substance will be sigma bonds, which you can see down here. You've got your one sigma between the C and the O, and then you also have a sigma here between your C and the H, and a sigma there between your C and the H, and those are all located around the bond axes. But the pi bond in that double bond is side-by-side -side overlapping P's, and those electrons are going to exist in this electron region above and below the bond plane. So the unhybridized P orbital overlap is what gives us that pi bond. Now when you take a look in a triple bond, remember we've got in a triple bond a single bond which will be, I should say, the first bond in the triple bond is that sigma bond in between which exists right there. And then we also have single bonds here between the carbon and the H in this particular substance. But we have also multiple bonds, a overlap of this front and back P with this front and back P that makes one pi orbital and then we have the up and down P that overlaps so we end up with one pi in front and behind and one pi above and below and remember when we're talking about resonance which we discussed earlier uh, many times when we have multiple bond then we have resonance issues and remember in resonance those electrons are delocalized so in writing the Lewis structure for a species like the nitrate ion NO3 minus, we basically draw all the resonant structures to really more accurately represent what's happening. And remember, the pi bonding that we're dealing with in this situation here, in this situation in here, in this situation there, is a delocalized set of pi electrons. So a way to visualize that would be this. So in a resonant situation, we have a pi situation that really is resonating between all these different positions within the nitrate anion. So the bottom picture would really be a better way to visualize the delocalized um, resonance pi bonding that occurs around that central nitrogen to each of the oxygen atoms. So that means the pi electrons are not localized around the nitrogen, they're actually delocalized throughout. So this top picture would represent accurately one of the resonant structures. But if we really want to show all resonant structures as one, that's really a better visualization of what's happening. Now, resonance can also occur, if you recall, in molecules like benzene, where you had the aromatic compound, um, six carbons with alternating double bonds around the ring. Well, remember, those are, as a double bond, those are pi electrons around each carbon atom. And remember, they're in resonance. So what you really end up with is a situation where these two really are existing at the same time. So a better way to represent that visually would be this representation over here. So because we have a resonant situation involved with this pi bonding, and remember this only applies when we're talking about resonance with pi bonding. If you just have a normal double bond with no resonance, the electrons are localized between those two atoms above and below the bond plane. But when you're dealing with a resonance situation, those electrons are delocalized throughout the entire structure. So the even distribution of the pi electron in benzene is really what makes it so unusually stable as a substance. And that ends our next set of notes for the chapter.